Can we continue thanking the Lord here for just a minute? Come on, can we raise our adoration and our prayer for him? God, you're awesome. Thank you. Welcome, South Shore. God bless you. Delighted that you're here today. So uh, how many of you grew up in a Catholic church? How many of you grew up Catholic? Yep, about a third of the people that come to the crossing grew up Catholic, and we had to do that field where we held hands. We're not going to do that right now in the name of Jesus, okay? I, I want to let you know. I just want you to, can you greet somebody next to you just with a genuine smile? Just say hello. Just say hi to them. Person, there you go. Just, just genuine. Don't overdo it. Don't overdo it. Okay. All right. Some of you are, some of you have been in church a long time. You're like, hello. I'm so glad. Whoa. Hey. You're getting in my space. Hey, just, you know, we want to be loving and friendly. And man, we, we want you to know that God is good. He is great. I hope you had a fantastic, fantastic Christmas and that you started the new year off great. Uh, we have an amazing team. I've been out for a couple of weeks and we've got an amazing team. Didn't they do a great, great job? They just did a great job. <clears throat> Seth and Richard and Pastor Hector last week. And so just if, you, if you're brand new, uh, hi, I'm Greg. Uh, you know what I mean? And um, right, in the name of Jesus. Um, a couple of little highlights from the time that we were gone. I think it's, it's, it's good to kind of just relate a little bit. So if you don't know us, we went to a wedding. Here's me and my wife. She's been uh, sick for, see, that's my goofy. I got the goofy thing going on right there. Um, and she is feeling better. She's had mono for like four and a half months, and she's back with us today. I am... Good to have my bride back. Hallelujah. We got to go fishing uh, and, and in the fishing trip. So my son and his buddy, we actually had, that, that's an American red snapper. We actually had to throw that fish back. All right. Yeah. Somebody said, what? Uh, well, yeah. Fishing regulations and so on. Um, but anyway, we had a great time, caught a lot of fish. My son caught a cobia. That is, that's called a cobia. And uh, it was scrumptious. It was good to eat. And this young man, his name is Brian, and he comes from a, a single mom family, five kids. And uh, 14 years ago, well, actually, it was longer than that. It was when he was seven, his father passed away. And I, 14 years ago, I got to take him on a camping trip. You know, mom came to me and said, hey, can you take Brian? You know, he's 11, and we went, went on the camping trip. Today, he's 25. He has successfully graduated from the Marine Corps. And uh, I wanted to take a minute. Yeah. I wanted to take a minute to just, do you have another clap in you at the, at the beginning here? I want to encourage single moms. Can you just? <laughs> Way to go, mom. Way to go, mom. And then, and then lastly, uh, you know, over the, over the holidays, we finally got permission from our oldest daughter to let you know that she is expecting her first child. <laughs> so we're excited about that to do in, in July. It's a little strange, you know, to have, so how many of you remember when they had pigtails? <laughs> it's, it's kind of strange to have your baby having babies, <laughs> you know, that's, that's still my baby. And uh, so I'm getting personal. So let me go ahead and get, uh, get back. <laughs> so I'm having a moment in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you for this day. We praise you. We love you. We honor you. We pray that we would learn the scripture today, that we would leave today, not just educated, not just filled in our head, but, but also moved in our spirit to worship you in Jesus name. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen. If you've got a Bible, grab it. If not, you're going to see the scripture on uh, the screen there with you. We're going to second Samuel chapter 24. Uh, this is setting is in about 980 BC before Christ, 980, about a thousand years before Christ came. And um, I want you to be aware of something in, uh, in our culture. One of the things that they're trying to do is systematically remove Christ, systematically. And so you will hear people say CE, which is common era. And common era, so we're in Israel, and they said, no, 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 it's not BC, before Christ, and AD, after death. It's, it's CE, common era. And I asked the question, I said, common to what? And the lady was like, she, she paused, and she was like, what are you talking about, Willis. And I said, I said, because there is no, Jesus is the figure in all of history. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. And our determination is to keep him present in our culture, in Jesus' name. It's not, it's not common era. It's before Jesus Christ and after 
death. All right, so you've got the nation of Israel. They're in two portions at this point, the larger kingdom of Israel and the smaller kingdom of Judah. King David is the king. And what happens in the text, we'll read in verse one in just a second, is that God gets, some of the teaching you're going to hear today is going to be, it's going to be a little surprising to you, um, but I want you to get the right connection to it, okay? God is upset with his people, the congregation. He's upset. So how many of you know that you can be loved? And and this is kind of a a weird question because of the diciness of fatherhood in our culture. How many of you know if you have a really, really good father? By the way, how many of you had a great father? Raise your hand. All right, write him a letter today. Man, tell him he's a unicorn in the name of Jesus. (laughs) Serious. I mean, uh, the kind of father that is a great father that's in the word of God, that loves Jesus, that loves you, was patient and kind. And you know what I mean? The list gets smaller the more you go towards that picture of looking like Jesus. God is the perfect father. He's perfect. He's sovereign. He loves you. You have the Holy Spirit. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, you have the Holy Spirit. But you're the one who's in charge of whether or not God is disappointed with you or upset with you currently right now. It got awful quiet in this Methodist church. This is, by the way, this isn't a Methodist church. It's a Bible-believing, life-giving, spirit-filled, I could keep going. Okay, so, so here's what I'm saying. God, you can be completely loved, and God can be upset at you, and we have to go through consequences of this thing called sin. When we, when we willfully do something that breaks the law of God, and, and it's easy to break ourselves on that law, or disappoint him, we're going to have to go through the difficulty of what that looks like. And so God is upset at the people, and so I need you to just say, what for? Thank you for being so enthusiastic today. God bless you. What for? So the people are tolerating division. There's a man named Absalom who is David's son, and Absalom went to the city gates to uh, entice the people to leave David's kingdom and to split the kingdom. And so there's Absalom, and then in verse in, in chapter 20, there's Sheba. And as this dialogue continues in the scripture, it's clear that God is judging the people for not just they're being very apathetic and not just apathetic, they're being actually accepting of, accepting of division and strife and backbiting. And so from a business perspective, here's what it looks like. How many of you have a book of business? You have a book of business. Good, one person in the congregation. Anybody in sales? Okay, anybody over uh, in charge of something as a division of labor at your workplace? Good, more people, okay. So let's say that you work and you grow that thing and then somebody that you put in place to manage it splits it and takes it out from underneath you. Is that cool or not cool? Not cool. The same thing happens in families. The same thing happens in business and the same thing happens in church. And what God is saying is, I don't want you to tolerate division any longer. I want you to speak up. And if you write on Facebook and be careful with what you do on Facebook in the name of Jesus, be careful. Take care in what you do. But defend the people that are around you. Defend your church. Defend your business. Defend. defend. Speak out against division because God isn't pleased with division. And whatever seed you sow, if you take something and you stick it into the ground, whatever you sow in the ground will come up and you will reap the harvest. And we don't want a bad harvest in 2019, do we? Oh, we want a good harvest. So God is judging the people, and God is also judging David. And so he uses David's prideful arrogance, and he incites David as the leader to take a census of the people. And so here, let's look at this, the scripture together. Again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, go and take a census of Israel and Judah. So he's judging Israel, the people, And he's judging the leadership simultaneously. And so what happens is, is that God uses the sin of David as a judgment and incites him to take the count. And so what that means is that as a leader, as a husband, as a wife, as a mom or a dad, I can shift. And instead of devoting myself to God and listening to him and doing, how many of you know that it is a little harder to listen to God than it is to do what the flesh says to do? I want, I, you gotta be, we've got to be patient. We've got to be long-suffering. I've got to hear from God. Or I get impatient, and, and, and God is okay with numbers. There's an entire book of the Bible called 
numbers. God is okay with numbers. God is okay with you making money as long as money doesn't have you. God is okay with you having a great house as long as the house doesn't have you. God is okay with you having a big church as long as the church and your desire for whatever it is numerically doesn't have you, pastors. Help me out. God is okay with you having stuff as long as stuff doesn't have you. And if you're not careful, we can shift over into stuff and miss what God has for us in following him and his spirit. So the people and David are getting judged. And this is miraculous. I want to translate it or transfer it to you today. Verse 10, David was conscience stricken. David was conscience stricken after he had counted the fighting men. And he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I've done. Now, O Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant, for I have done a very foolish thing. And I pray in the name of Jesus, right here in at South Shore, that we would translate that to our own hearts this year. And whatever it is that we've been messing around with, that we would be conscience stricken before the Lord. That we would say, oh God, that's not where I belong. That's not, what I, that's not what I intended, God. I got trapped in this or I willingly did this and my conscience is pierced and I've done a foolish thing. And so there's a, a prophet named Gad who comes to David and he says, hey, God is not pleased with this. And, and so you take this message for whatever it is today to you and your family, your choices. And he says, God is gonna come and he is gonna give you three choices because judgment is, comes with sin, all right? Now, that teaching is a little bit alien in the church where you go, man, are you, are you does God, so let's settle this. Does God love you? Yes. Has God bled and died for you? Yes. Are you accepted? Yes. Can you ever not be accepted? No. The answer is no. But you are in charge of how God feels about you right now. And just like a father, you could say, I love you. And, and you know, this house is still your house and all those things, but go to your bedroom. And because, because the way you're acting and what you're doing right now breaks your consciousness between you and me, and it leads you to not be who you are in the Dumas household. It leads you to not represent Papa and Mama the right way. It leads you to break your form and your identity in the world. And now I am, there is judgment that comes with sin. If I sin, God doesn't kick me out of the kingdom. He doesn't kick me out of relationship. I just have to deal with the burden and the consequences of my sin. And God does not give a pass the way you think God gives a pass. He's not a doting grandfather up there handing out candy that says, oh, now this is the seventh or the eighth or the twelfth time. He is long-suffering. Church, God is long-suffering, and he's merciful, and he is kind. But don't play with God. Don't play with God. He's not a man. He, he's, he's not a man. He's kind and gracious beyond anything you've ever seen. He is just and he is righteous. So he says to David through Gad, the prophet, he says, you, you have three, you have, there's three things and you get to choose. He said, you can have famine in the land for three years and people will suffer. He said, you can have, uh, your enemies will have their way with you for three months and you'll suffer at the hands of man or you have a plague for three days. And David goes to God through Gad, the prophet, and he says, I'm putting my hands I'm putting my fate in the hands of a merciful God. And I would pray that you would do the same thing. Instead of letting it ride out at work or ride out with your family, you would say, oh, merciful God, I've sinned against you and God Almighty, my life is to please you. I want to please you. And I want the reproach to roll off of me and my family and my life. And so I'm asking you, God, to deal with me. I'm asking you. And so Gad comes back and he says, God is merciful. And so God is going to deal with you in a way. He said, you get the three days, three days of plague. And plague struck the nation for three days and 70,000 people died. That's a lot of folks. Let me, let me just say it again in a way that you understand. God, God don't play. Now there's a little, okay. And so David is conscience stricken. He falls on his face and and the seer, the prophet says, do you want the plague to stop? And I want to ask you that question today. Do you want the plague to stop? 
Do you want the plague in your marriage or your finances or your health and the church, the city that we live in, the nation that we live in? And so it's very easy for us when we come to church and every time we preach a message, it's, I, I want you to just be tuned to the fact that when, when the message is being preached, your posture and your understanding of the, the message, if you want something to happen to you, go ahead and intend for it to happen. Go ahead and get in a position where you're saying, I don't know this guy, maybe, maybe we're best friends, and maybe we've known each other for 25 years or 30, maybe it's the first time you've ever heard or seen anybody that you're talking to, male or female, on the radio, you're listening because you want biblical content, but you're also saying, what is the nugget you can drop in from my life that I need right now? What's the thing that I can take right now in this posture? And I'm asking God right now as I'm listening for the thing that he wants to do inside of me. What does Jesus want to change inside of me? And how do I appropriate this stopping of the plague? And when we think about plague, I think instead of going through all the things that we're plagued with, I think that I will just want to give you one illustration. Is that okay? Just one. Okay. My wife and I were on a digital media format, and I'm, I'm not going to even tell you what the format is. Because if I tell you, some of you would be tempted, even while you're in the service, to pull it up. Right? <laughs> That's what sin does. We don't know that we're disappointed in our car until we go to the Lexus dealership and see the one that's in the showroom, right? And then as soon as I see the one that's in the showroom, I'm like, yes, I push this button and the genie pops up out of here and she serves me a cup of tea on the way and all, and, right? So we don't know and the enticement to know breaks us on God's law if we're not careful to pull ourselves back away from that thing. And so what God is, is doing and what God is saying is he's saying, I just want you to be really mindful of what's taking place in your life because the plague is in our world and the plague is in our country. The plague is in our, our it's right here in Hillsborough County and the plague is even in our homes. The plague is in our hearts. This plague that God is talking about will steal, kill, and destroy. It's the voice of the enemy. And so we, we went onto this platform and we were going to search for a movie, and it says trending now. It's the big banner on top, trending now. And my wife is sitting next to me, so I have some safety. And it says sex education. It has a picture of two teenagers walking up a hill holding hands. And I think to myself, because I, I want to stay current, but I want to stay protected at the same time. My wife is with me. I go, yeah, you want to check this out? Yeah. So I push the button within 30 seconds. I mean, to count to 30, you know, 10, 20, 30. Within 30 seconds, there are two kids there completely undressed, completely undressed in the middle of the sexual act. What? <laughs> Am I starting to blush right now? I was like beside myself. What, what in the world is this? And so, so I, I want to tell you, they, and I, you know, I, we could name a lot of they's. They're coming for our kids. And part of the reason why they're coming for their kids is because they got us. And so when we talk about the plague in our culture and in our nation, I don't want you to think about the nation. Man, the nation needs to change. I want you to do something that's really kind of unexpected in church. I'm going to put your hands right here. Say, I need to change. Woo! I cannot tell you how many messages I teach and somebody comes up to me afterwards and they go, my brother needs to hear that message. <laughs> hey, you have a podcast of that? Because, you know, and, and I'm being kind because a lot of times they're talking about their husband or their wife. She needs to hear, he needs to hear this. Well, I tell you what, I, I need to hear this. I need to hear this. I need to hear this. And what God did, what he said to David, is he said, do you want the plague to stop? And, so when I, and you don't have to respond and shout. I'm going to ask you, do you want the plague to stop? Then he says, I want you to do two things. I want you to build an altar, and I want you to sacrifice on the altar. Join me in the scripture where it says in verse 24, but the king replied to Aruna. He went to a man named Aruna who had a threshing floor where he threshed his weed and, and the seer, Gad, said, I want you to go to him and I want you to buy the piece of property and I want you to build an altar and I want you to sacrifice on the altar. And Aruna says to him, take it for free. David says, I will not take it for free. And I need you to understand this today. It's a really critical point in the message. I, I, I'm not going to take it for free. Don't give things to God that cost you nothing. 
because they'll amount to nothing. But the king replied to Aruna, no, I insist. And would you, would you humor me? Would you just say, I insist? No, I insist on paying you for it. I know there's a price to be paid in marriage. I'm going to pay it. I know there's a price to be paid in prayer. I'm going to pay it. I know there's a price to be paid in being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to pay it. I know there's a price to pay for faith. I'm going to pay it. I know there's a price to pay to be in relationship with other people. I'm willing to pay. And I don't mean to pay. I'm really sorry. If you're brand new, I'm ADD as the day is long. I really, I have like 14 <laughs> thoughts simultaneously. So <clears throat> I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David bought, 2019, buy it. Just say to God today, whatever it takes. God, whatever it takes, God, whatever it takes in my marriage, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. And don't be tricked to think that this is in the flesh. I'm going to get stronger and I'm going to learn more and all those kind of things. We want you to learn. We want you to get strong. But you get strong as you get weak. You find your life when you die. Don't be tricked by the devil. He can get us in the flesh so quickly. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and he paid 50 shekels of silver for them. And David built an altar there and he sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings then then after he recognized in his conscience this is not the way I want to live and after he said I refuse to just try to do this for free and casually stroll up to God and, and just go man I'm, I'm here God so the rest is your responsibility no 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 I, I want you to I want you to pay the price And I want you to build an altar. And on that altar, I want you to burn up the offering, which becomes a fragrance to the Lord. And he smells that fragrance and he sees you. And now because of Jesus, he sees the sacrifice of Jesus and he forgives and he halts the plague. And so in the Old Testament, he says here, on the altar of the Lord, the sacrifice of the burnt offerings, the fellowship offerings, then the Lord answered prayer. You don't have to raise your hands. How many of you want to? Your prayers answered in 2019. You want your prayers answered. I want to hear God's voice on behalf of the land and the plague of Israel was stopped. And there's two things that I want to, I want to just kind of make this real practical for you. This is an altar right here in that South Shore. This is an altar. And if you've never been a part of a church where there's an altar, if you grew up Catholic, you know about the altar. And the altar is kind of ritualistic, and you go and you do the holy water, and those are symbols and signs. You take the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, those are symbols, and those are signs that try to bind you to the person of Jesus Christ. And so the physical altar, I'm inviting you at the Crossing Church, visitors, those of you who are here, I'm inviting you. If you're an ironman, if you're a leader, if you're a life group leader, if you're part of sisterhood, the altar is to come to the altar. Or this is kind of the theme in January as we start is the altar is a place where you come and you would say, I'm burdened. And I don't know how many of you come in today and as we go through worship, you're distracted or you can't identify with the words and, and, and you feel weighty. Maybe you feel heavy or maybe you've got something that you'd say, I wish this was out of my life. This is the place where we win. This is the place This is the place where we hear from God. This is the place where we receive prayer, an altar in the church. And so in a little while, when I ask you to, when I just say, hey, come, if you have that burden, if you have a need, how many people, I mean, how many of you people are struggling with marriage? Don't raise your hands. You'll get in trouble. (laughs) If you have a perfect marriage and perfect health and your finances are great and everything is going well, come and pray for me when we're done with the service. Please. If you, if you have anything that's short of that, let's all go to the altar together. What we thought about the altar, church, what we thought about it is that we thought it's a place of shame. It's not a place of shame. The altar isn't saying shame on you. The altar is saying shame off of you. The altar... The altar is a place of humility. The altar is a place of brokenness. The altar is a place of saying to God, God, I didn't come here to play. I came here to do business with you. I came here to leave different than I walked in. 
I will not, I don't want the enemy to do what he's been doing in my marriage or in my life or in my health or in my finances. And I'm willing to go to a God who is alive. I may need some help. I may need some traffic. And we've got people that are trained at both campuses to pray and to lead you. And I want to tell you, they don't have the answers, but they'll point you to the one who does. So the altar is in the church and the altar is in our homes. And I want to encourage you, every single one of you, to build an altar in your house. Build an altar in your house and go worship with your God. Find him through the word. It's very, very simple. I'm going to show you what an altar looks like. This is, it might surprise you. This is our kitchen table. That's my wife's uh, arrangement for her altar. Some of you are like, oh, it doesn't look very holy. It's a mundane place where miraculous things take place. Find a place in your home that you can carve out and, and you know, be careful Googling this too. I kind of look through altars and there are, 14, there are 14 different items for when you Google altars and not a single one of them are Christian. Be careful. Be careful what's going on, on online because there's a lot of spiritism without Jesus. There's a whole lot. And, you know, it talks about, yeah, let me stay on track. crystals, and it talks about all kinds of stuff. And by the way, if you, ha- if you have that, that's exactly how I feel about that, too. <laughs> that was at the Tampa campus, so God bless you, South Shore. Here's my altar. It's, a, it's kind of a, a little fix on my office, so not just business, but the Word of God. And then I have a, kneel, a kneeling bench that somebody created for me. And the only reason why I have that is because my knees aren't good enough to be on the floor anymore. And I know some of you are in that circumstance as well. God, God bless you. Here's what you need. You need a place and you need some space. Very practical. You need worship and you need prayer. There's a new album by Bethel Worship. It's called Victory. The album is called Victory. It's the anthem, I believe, for 2019. You need to hear the Word of God. You need to have the Word of God in front of you. You can play it on you version. There are lots of ways you can do it. I've been accustomed to it, the Crossing Church, especially with the larger group of people of asking very, very small. Just the small little ask. And I feel like God is saying in 2019, go ahead and ask big. And, and so my ask is this, why don't you, if you want your life to change, go ahead and start spending, God, spending time with God every day. Every, every day we go to the altar and you need something to write with. Sometimes it's a pen or paper, other times it's a tablet or your computer, just so that you can record. And I want to say this to you, you cannot get to who God called you to be. We want biblical awe. Woo, I want to walk on water. But we do not, we absolutely reject biblical devotion. And biblical devotion is what gets you connected to a God who's supernatural so that you can, for lack of better terms, walk on water. Because you have to have different weapons that are formed to fight the fight that you're trying to fight. Because the fight that you're trying to fight is with entities that are bigger than you are. Okay, let me finish. An altar and we want to bring our sacrifice. Fasting, we're corporately fasting here. We're going, to, we're going to begin the fast on the 17th, next Thursday. And we're going to go for 21 days. So I'm asking everybody in the congregation to fast, to fast. Something in your life. And we've had the lower bar ask, and that's legitimate if you're brand new to fasting. You can go to this website, and you can get all the information that you want about fasting and learning and how to do it. There is science to fasting. Let me encourage you first. Here's here's what not to do. Don't eat as many carbs as you can before the day of the fast. That's tragic. We'll have to give you a Snickers in the middle of your work day. I promise you won't be yourself. I'm asking everybody to learn and to begin to fast over those 21 days. Fast something. And then I'm asking all of you, and if you can, I'm just going to walk down just a little bit. And I want you to camera lights and South Shore, I want to stay connected with you. And uh, here's, here, listen, on the 23rd, let's try 12 hours of no food. On the 23rd. Let's everybody try 12 hours of no food. And if you're one of the people that you have some sort of medical condition, then check with your doctor and so on. But 99.99999% of us can fast food. The devil is a liar. You're not going to pass out at work. Make sure that you prep to get there. Make sure that you prep to get there. If you have a heavy work schedule, all that kind of stuff. So let's fast food. Now listen, somebody in the last service said, eat fast food. 
say, I'm in for that kind of fast. <laughs> All day, I'm in. No, fast, actual food. Try it. Now, when you fast the actual food, take the food away, but please do not miss this part or you'll miss everything. Take the food away and insert a time block to get with God. So when you're at work, you need 30 minutes. If you can only get 15, grab 15. If you can get an hour, get an hour and bring your word and a journal and the Bible. Fasting isn't to just make you travail. Fasting is to remove something to replace it with something else so that you'll finally understand that there's something that satisfies the spiritual hunger that we're trying to always fix by eating. You can't eat enough food to satisfy your spirit. Although I like some comfort food. Are you guys with me? My soul gets comfortable for a minute. My belt expands with it. So what we do in the natural is trying to address the spiritual and we never do get there. So fasting addresses the natural to get to the spiritual. We just want to take that moment on the 23rd. And if you're more advanced, we want to take the 30th. So we're going to all do that. The 30th through the first, those three days, and we're going to fast then as well. So we're going to fast the three to one day. Everybody choose something for 21 days. And you can, you know, I'm getting rid of chocolate or Coca-Cola or whatever it is. I'm going to fast media and all that stuff. Good. Let's go to food now. On that one day on the 23rd and then the 30th through the 1st are three days if you're more advanced and you want to do that, okay? <gasps> Try it. You can do it. God bless you. All right. Self is the last sacrifice. Spoiler alert. You're not going to find a lamb somewhere in your backyard that you get to put on this altar. You're not going to find a goat. You're not going to find a pigeon. You're not going to be able to find a... It, it's not going to work out well for you if you take a cow and butcher it in your yard. This actually happened. The, all of the Old Testament is about taking an animal and sacrificing that animal on the altar until Jesus, who was the Lamb of God, who was slain before the foundation of the world, replaced that entire system and became the final and ultimate sacrifice for you and me. He died on the altar... So what he says to us, he says, do you want to have life? I'm going to ask you a question. Do you want life? He says, then sacrifice the one that you have to give to me. And so the spoiler alert is that you're the sacrifice. Your own life is the sacrifice. I have a sacrifice that's perfect in Jesus. And if I want to get my life aligned in him to have the spiritual content that I need in Jesus Christ, God says, I want you to die to selfishness. I want you to die to hate and bitterness and envy and jealousy and strife. And I want you to die to the flesh and the old man or the old woman, the old way of thinking. And I want you to come alive. So your death is tragic, but your life is beautiful. You go through the pain. You willingly surrender yourself to go through the pain to give birth to something that's alive. Come on, ladies, in the name of Jesus. You go through the sickness and the stretching and the E.T. baby in there. Sorry, some of you guys don't remember E.T. I call it E.T. It's a little gross. You know, the baby's like, "Woo! I want to come out now. Here we go. So let, so let me describe this to you. Listen, listen, hang on. <clears throat> You'll know that your life is starting to change when the baby that God's placed in you, the Spirit of God, can't wait to get out. When you're just, I mean, we, we've seen, we, we, I don't know if it's in the water here at the crossing. There's a lot of mommies about to have babies here at the crossing. And woo, 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 hey, everybody gets happy. Yeah, yeah. So what, we, what, we're, what we're asking God for is there'd be a lot of, a lot of mommies and, and that, are, that are pregnant, that would be men and women that would be pregnant with the Spirit of God and what God really wants to do with them. And you would be, when we sing, your baby would jump. When we worship, your baby would jump. When, when, we, when we come to offer and service, our, your baby would jump. That there would be something living inside of you. And God's saying, you have to die to yourself in order to see that victory. 
That's where we give a burnt offering and ourselves go away and the fullness of God comes forward and something that hasn't lived before is conceived inside of you and it takes full breath in life and your new life in Jesus is birthed in your surrender and your sacrifice here and in your home. And there's a, there's a famous video clip that I want you to see. It's from the movie 300. If you've, how many of you have seen the Hollywood movie 300? Okay, if you haven't seen it and you hear me mention it today, um, be advised, it is graphic. This is violent, okay? There, it's about a historical event that took place at Thermopylae, a small pass. The leader of Greece is King Leonidas, and he faces the, the, the uh, Persian leader named Xerxes. We're going to talk about Esther next week, 480 B.C., and that's the same king that Esther served under. So this historical event is the same king. We're going to reference it next week. And Leonidas leads a group of 300 men to face an army of 800,000 men. He faces them in this narrow pass, and the Persians defeat them. But let me give you the setting. Those 300 set the stage because they had to take time in their defeat and in their victory in their surrender to the Lord. They lost that, that war of 300, but then the Greeks had time to amass, and they had inspiration. And they came back and beat the Persians later that same year at Salamis. There was Themistocles led them in that one. I, I, just, I just wanted to say the word Themistocles. I, just, I mean, somebody, somebody name your son Themistocles just for me. So Leonidas lost, but Leonidas won for a whole bunch of people. And the 300 men lost, they sacrificed, but those 300 men saved hundreds of thousands. And so when you're willing to sacrifice, build an altar, and you climb up on that altar in your home and at the church, when you're willing to sacrifice your life and live for Jesus, you set the stage for hundreds of thousands of people to be free. And God is asking us and calling us to that life. And I want you to see this clip to, to end. We'll comment in just a second. Dark sauce. What a pleasant surprise. This morning's full of surprises, Leonidas. We've been tricked. There'll be more than a few hundred of them. This is a surprise. Silence. This isn't an army. We heard Sparta was on the warpath. We were eager to join forces. If it is blood you seek, you're welcome to join us. Would you bring only this handful of soldiers against Xerxes? You see, I was wrong to expect Sparta's commitment to at least match our own. Doesn't it? You, there. What is your profession? I'm a potter, sir. And you, Arcadian, what is your profession? Sculptor, sir. You? Blacksmith. Spartans! What is your profession? <laughs> you see, old friend, I brought more soldiers than you did. So the band that he was talking to had three or four or five times the number of people there. And really, in the American church, what we've got, eight, 80 percent of the people say that they're Christians. Eight out of 10. And so first is the question, that, are you a Christian? Are you a believer? Have you trusted in Jesus Christ? But the more important question after the first question really is, what kind? <laughs> okay, you say you're a believer. What kind? What kind? Are you, are, you a, are you the kind that will say to the enemy, right here I stand, right here, and I'm willing to die. I'm willing to die for my kids. I'm willing to die for my country. I'm willing to die for my church. I'm willing to die. And I don't mean that I'm going to die and, and actually a physical death, although there is a lot of pain in dying. There's a lot of self-sacrifice in dying. It means that to live is Christ and to die is gain. It means that I have trusted in Jesus Christ and I give him my life, and yet I live, Galatians 2.20. Because Christ now lives inside of me. And the old life that I had, I used to live in, that life dies. 
And so what God is saying to us, he's saying to you, he's saying to me, he's saying, I, I want you to go ahead and start that commitment today. And so let's do it. Bow your heads with me. Everyone bow your heads right here in that South Shore. And this is a simple prayer. It's the salvation prayer. I'm going to pause when you think about the Lord, when you think about your life. What, what do you want today? And let's say this together. Here's what the Bible says. Say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I surrender. Come live inside of me. In Jesus' name. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want, you to just, I want you to pop your hands up for me. If you're trusting Christ for the very first time, right here and at South Shore, slip your hand up on the count of three. One, two, three. Slip your hand up. Come on, just raise your hand right up. Just saying, I'm giving my life to Jesus. I see you. Who else? I see you. I see you. Come on. Come on. Just slip your hand up. I see you. Who else? I see you right here to my right. I see you. I see you. Who else? Come on, you're slipping your hand up. You're saying, today is the day. I'm giving my life to Jesus. I'm not going to wait any longer. I see you. Gotcha. Who else? Anybody else today? Anybody else today? I said, today I surrender. Today I surrender. One last time. I, just, I want to give you this moment with the Lord. This last time. Anybody else? Slip your hand up for me. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Can we thank the Lord today? Can we thank him? Amen. All right, now why don't we stand together? Let's stand. And so I want to encourage you, prayer partners. I want to encourage you, iron men, leaders, life group leaders. I want you to just make your way. You begin to come now. And now, here's the call. If you have something going on in your life that matters to God, and you'd like to leave it at the altar, I'm going to ask you to just, right now, I'm going to just pray for you. I'm just going to pray that you would just have the courage and the confidence to just, we're standing so that you can make a way. And some of you are already coming. Just come make your way. Come right here. Come right here. Let God meet you in this place. If you have a marital thing, you have a financial thing, you have a health thing, come let God meet you right here on this altar. Let's practice what God is calling us to do in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you that you've given us this grace and this opportunity. We take it. We take it. In Jesus' name, amen. You begin to come. Day and night.